Section 89 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by T.J. Burns. Al Mansur, builder of Baghdad, and the poet. 8th century A.D. Adapted from the Arabic by Claude Field. Al Mansur, the third caliph of the house of Abbas, succeeded his brother El Shafa, the blood shedder, A.D. 754. He was a prince of great prudence, integrity, and discretion but these good qualities were sullied by his extraordinary covetousness and occasional cruelty he patronized poets and learned men and was endowed with a remarkable memory it is said that he could remember a poem after having only once heard it he also had a slave who could commit to memory anything that he had heard twice and a slave girl who could do the same with what she had heard three times one day there came to him a poet bringing a congratulatory ode and al mansur said to him if it appears that anybody knows it by heart or that any one composed it that is to say that it was brought here by some other person before thee we will give thee no recompense for it but if no one knows it we will give thee the weight in money of that upon which it is written so the poet repeated his poem and the caliph at once committed it to memory although it contained a thousand lines then he said to the poet listen to it from me and he recited it perfectly then he added and this slave too knows it by heart this was the case as he had heard it twice once from the poet and once from the caliph then the caliph said and this slave girl who is concealed by the curtain she also recollects it so she repeated every letter of it and the poet went away unrewarded another poet al asmaye was among the intimate friends and table companions of the caliph he composed some very difficult verses and scratched them upon a fragment of a marble pillar which he wrapped in a cloak and placed on the back of a camel then he disguised himself like a foreign arab and fastened on a face cloth so that nothing was visible but his eyes and came to the caliph and said verily i have lauded the commander of the faithful in a casida ode then said al mansur o oh, brother of the arabs if the poem has been brought by any one beside thee we will give thee no recompense for it otherwise we will bestow on thee the weight in money of that upon which it is written so el esmae recited the casida which as it was extraordinarily intricate and difficult the caliph could not commit to memory he looked toward the slave and the girl but they had neither of them learnt it so he cried o oh, brother of the arabs bring hither that whereon it is written that we may give thee its weight then said the seeming arab o oh, my lord of a truth i could find no paper to write it upon but i had amongst the things left me at my father's death a piece of a marble column which had been thrown aside as useless so i scratched the casida upon that then the caliph had no help for it but to give him its weight in gold and this nearly exhausted his treasury the poet took it and departed end of section eighty nine this recording is in the public domain recording by t j burns Section 90 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by Angelique Campbell. Al Mansur rebuked. 8th century A.D. Adapted from the Arabic by Claude Field. Terrible as was the wrath of Al Mansur when roused, there were not wanting on occasion those among his subjects who had the courage to rebuke him once the caliph was addressing an audience at damascus and said o ye people it is incumbent on you to give praise to the most high that he has sent me to reign over you for verily since i began to reign over you he has taken away the plague which had come amongst you but a certain arab cried out to him of a truth allah is too merciful to give us both thee and the plague at one time on another occasion the theologian malik ibn Anis relates the following one day the caliph mansur sent for me and my friend ibn taos against whom he was known to entertain a grudge when we entered the presence chamber 
we beheld the executioner with his sword drawn and the leather carpet spread on which it was customary to behead criminals the caliph signed to us to seat ourselves and when we had done so he remained a long time with his head bent in meditation he then raised it and turning to ibn Tawa, said recite me a saying of the prophet on whom it be peace ibn Tawas replied the prophet of god has said the worst punished criminals in the day of judgment will be those to whom god has entrusted authority and who have abused it the caliph was silent and there was a pause i trembled and drew my garments close round me lest any of the blood of ibn Taus, whom i expected to see instantly executed should spear it upon them then the caliph said to ibn Taus, hand me that ink-pot but he never stirred why don't you hand it asked the caliph because he said i fear you may write some wrong order and i do not wish to share the responsibility get up and go the caliph growled precisely what we were desiring answered ibn Taus, of whose courage and coolness i from that day formed a high opinion end of section ninety this recording is in the public domain section ninety one of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phone the world story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section ninety one al mahdi and the two wishes eighth century a d adapted from the arabic by claude field al mahdi the third caliph of the abbasid dynasty succeeded his father abu jafar al mansur a d seven hundred and seventy four he was as prodigal as his father was avaricious and rapidly squandered his vast inheritance al mansur had appointed as his instructor before he succeeded to the throne sharki ibn kotami who was learned in all the lore and traditions of the arabs one evening al mahdi asked his preceptor to divert him with some amusing anecdote i obey prince may god protect you answered sharki they relate that a certain king of hira had two courtiers whom he loved equally with himself they never quitted his society night or day in the palace or on a journey he took no decision without consulting them and his wishes coincided with theirs thus they lived together a long time but one evening the king having drunk to excess drew his sword from the sheath and rushing upon his two friends killed them then he fell into a drunken slumber the next morning when told of what he had done he cast himself upon the earth biting it in his fury weeping for his friends and bewailing the loss of them he fasted for some days and swore that for the rest of his life he would abstain from the beverage which had deprived him of reason then he had them buried and erected a shrine over their remains to which he gave the title el garean the two effigies he commanded in addition that no person should pass this monument without prostrating themselves now like the laws of the medes and persians every custom set up by a king of hira could not be changed but became a hard and fast tradition handed on from generation to generation the command therefore of the king was rigidly observed his subjects of low and high degree never passed before the double tomb without prostrating themselves this usage gradually acquired the binding force of a religious rite the king had ordered that any one who refused to conform to it should be punished with death after expressing two wishes which would be granted no matter what they were one day a fuller passed bearing on his back a bundle of clothes and a mallet the guardians of the mausoleum ordered him to kneel down he refused they threatened him with death he persisted in his refusal they brought him before the king whom they informed of the matter why did you refuse to bow down asked the king i did bow down answered the man they are lying no you are the liar said the king express two wishes they shall be granted and then you will die nothing then can save me from death after those men have accused me asked the fuller nothing very well replied the fuller 
Here is my wish. I wish to strike the king on the head with this mallet. Fool, answered the king. It were better worth your while to let me enrich those whom you leave behind you. No, said the fuller. I only wish to strike the king on the back of his head. The king then addressed his ministers. What do you think, he said to them, of the wish of this madman? Your majesty, they answered, you yourself have instituted this law. Your majesty knows better than any one else that the violation of law is a shame, a calamity, a crime which involves damnation. Besides, after having violated one law, you will violate a second, then a third. Your successors will do the same, and all our laws will be profaned. The king replied, Get this man to ask anything he likes. Provided he lets me off, I am ready to grant all his requests, even to the half of my kingdom. They laid these proposals before the fuller, but in vain. He declared that he had no other wish but to strike the king. The latter, seeing that the man was thoroughly resolved, convoked a public assembly. The fuller was introduced. He took his mallet and struck the king on the back of his head so violent a blow that he fell from his throne and lay stretched on the ground unconscious. Subsequently, he lay ill with fever for six months and was so severely injured that he could only drink a drop at a time. At last he got well, recovered the use of his tongue, and could eat and drink. He asked for news of the fuller. On being told that he was in prison, he summoned him and said, There is still a wish remaining to you. Express it, so that I may order your death according to law. Since it is absolutely necessary that I must die, replied the fuller, I wish to strike you another blow on the head. At these words the king was seized with dismay, and exclaimed that it was all over with him. At last he said to the fuller, Wretch, renounce a claim which is profitless to you. What advantage have you reaped from your first wish? Ask for something else, and whatever it is, I will grant it no said the man i only demand my right the right to strike you once more the king again consulted his ministers who answered that the best thing for him was to resign himself to death in obedience to the law but said the king if he strikes me again i shall never be able to drink any more i know what i have already suffered we cannot help that your majesty answered the ministers finding himself in this extremity the king said to the fuller, Answer, fellow, that day when you were brought hither by the guardians of the mausoleum, did I not hear you declare that you had prostrated yourself and that they had slandered you? Yes, I did say so, answered the fuller, but you would not believe me. The king jumped from his seat, embraced the fuller, and exclaimed, I swear that you are more truthful than these rascals, and that they have lied at your expense. I give you their place, and authorize you to inflict upon them the punishment they have deserved. al Mahdi laughed heartily on hearing this story, complimented the narrator, and rewarded him generously. End of section 91. This recording is in the public domain. Section 92 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 92. Harun al-Rashid and the Musician, 8th century A.D. Adapted from the Arabic by Claude Field. Ibrahim Muzeli relates the following story. Rashid one day summoned all his musicians. I and Meskin of Medina were among the performers. Rashid had partaken freely of wine and wished to hear performed an air which had suddenly occurred to his mind. The officer stationed before the curtain which concealed the caliph told Ibn Jami to sing this piece. The latter obeyed, but did not succeed in pleasing the caliph. Each of the singers present attempted it, but were no more successful than Ibn Jami. Then the officer, addressing Meskin, said, The commander of the faithful orders you to sing this air if you can do it properly. Meskin commenced at once to sing, to the great surprise of the audience, who could not understand how a musician like him had the courage to attempt before us an air which none of us had been able to render to the satisfaction of the caliph. 
As soon as he had finished, I heard Rashid raise his voice and ask to hear it a second time. Miss Keene recommenced with a skill and spirit which won him everybody's applause. The caliph congratulated and praised him to the skies. Then he had the curtain behind which he had been sitting drawn aside. Prince of the Believers, then said Meskin to him, a strange story attaches to this piece, and at the invitation of the caliph he narrated it in these words. I was formerly a slave of a member of the family of Zobier, and carried on the trade of a tailor. My master claimed from me a tax of two dirhams daily, after paying which I was free to do what I liked. I was passionately fond of singing. One day a descendant of Ali, for whom I had just completed a tunic, paid me two dirhams for it, kept me to eat with him, and made me drink generously. As I left him I met a negress carrying her pitcher on her shoulder and singing the song you have just heard. I was so delighted at it that, forgetting everything else, I said to her, By the prophet I adjure thee to teach me that air. By the prophet, she answered, I will not teach it unless you pay me two dirhams. Then, Prince of Believers, I took out the two dirhams with which I intended to pay my daily tax and gave them to the negress. She, setting her pitcher down, sat on the ground and, keeping time with her fingers on the pitcher, sang the piece and repeated it till it was well impressed on my memory. I then proceeded to my master. As soon as he saw me he demanded his two dirhams, and I related my adventure to him. "'Scoundrel,' he said, "'have I not warned you that I will take no excuse even if a farthing is missing?' Saying this, he laid me on the ground, and with the utmost vigor of his arm gave me fifty strokes of a rod, and as an additional disgrace caused my head and chin to be shaved. Verily, O Prince, I passed a melancholy night. The severe punishment I had undergone made me forget the peace I had learnt, and this was the saddest of all. In the morning, wrapping my head in a cloak, I hid my large tailor's scissors in my sleeve, and directed my steps to the spot where I had met the negress. I waited there in perplexity, not knowing her name nor her abode. All at once I saw her coming. The sight of her dispersed all my cares. I approached her, and she said to me, By the Lord of the Kaaba, you have forgotten the song. Yes, I have, I answered. I told her how my head and chin had been shaved, and offered her a reward if she would sing her song again. By the prophet, she answered, I will not, for less than two dirhams. I took out my scissors and ran and pawned them for two dirhams, which I gave her. She put down her pitcher and began to sing as she had done the evening before. But as soon as she began, I said, Give me back the two dirhams. I don't need your song. By Alice, she said, You shall not see them again. Don't think it. Then she added, I am certain that the four dirhams you have spent will be worth to you four thousand dinars from the hand of the caliph. Then she resumed her song, accompanying herself as before on her pitcher, and did not cease repeating it till I had got it by heart. We separated. I returned to my master, but in a state of great apprehension. When he saw me, he demanded his daily due, while I stammered out excuses. Beast, he shouted, was not yesterday's lesson enough for you? I wish to speak to you frankly and without falsehood, I answered. Yesterday's and today's dirhams went in payment for a song, and I began to sing it to him. What? he exclaimed. You have known an air like that for two days and told me nothing of it? May my wife be divorced if it is not true that I would have let you go yesterday if you had sung it to me. Your head and chin have been shaved, I cannot help that, but I let you off your tax till your hair grows again. Hearing this recital, Rashid laughed heartily and said to the musician, I don't know which is better, your song or your story. I will see in my turn that the forecast of the negress is verified. So Meskin went out from the caliph's presence richer by four thousand dinars. End of section 92. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 93 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 93. The Caliph and the Poet of the Barmex. 8th Century A.D. by E.H. Palmer. 
After the fall of the Barmek family, Harun forbade the poets to write elegies upon them, imposing severe penalties upon anyone who should act contrary to this regulation. It so happened that some of the night watch were passing by one of the ruined palaces which had formerly belonged to the unfortunate family, when they came upon a man with a strip of paper in his hand containing an elegy upon the barmix, which he was reciting, weeping as he did so. The watch arrested him and took him before al-Rashid, to whom he at once acknowledged the fact. Did you not know of my prohibition, said the caliph? I'll make an example of you, I'll... If your majesty will hear my story first, said the prisoner, you may do what you please. Go on, said Harun. Formerly, commenced the poet, I was one of the least of Yahya bin Khalid's clerks. One day, the vizier said to me, I wish you to entertain me at your house, sometime or other. I replied, Oh, my lord, I am not deserving of such an honor, and my house is quite unfit for you. And as he would take no denial, I asked for a year's delay that I might make fitting preparations but he would not allow me more than a few months. So I set about my preparations, and as soon as they were completed to the best of my ability, I informed the minister that I was ready to receive him. The next day, he came to me with his two sons, Jaffer and El Fadl, and a few of his private suite. Then he stopped his horse at my door and alighted. Now then, he said, I am hungry. Make haste and get me something to eat. And his son, El Fadl, whispered, He likes roast fowl. Bring whatever you have got, as soon as possible. So I went in and got the dinner ready. When the vizier had finished eating, he got up and walked about the place, and then said suddenly, Now then, sir, show me all over your house. I answered, This is my house, my lord. I have no other. Oh, yes, you have, said he. You have another. I assured him that it was the only one I possessed, whereupon he called for some masons, and when they appeared, he commanded them to break open a door in the wall. In this, I remonstrated and said, Oh, my lord, how can I break into my neighbor's house when God has commanded us to respect our neighbor's rights? Never mind, he said, and when the door was made, we all went through it, and came into a beautiful garden, well planted with fruit and flowers, with fountains bubbling up, and summer houses, and dwellings, and everything that could delight the eye. The house itself was beautifully furnished, and filled with servants and slave girls, everything on a most magnificent scale. This house, said the vizier, and all belonging to it is yours. Then I kissed his hands and prayed for blessings on him, and he turned to his son Jaffer and said, How is he to keep up this establishment, my boy? And Jaffer said, I will give him such and such an estate and make out of the conveyance of it to him immediately. Then Yahya turned to El Fadl and said, What is he to do, my boy? for ready money until he receives the revenues of his estate? Oh, said El Fadl, I will give him ten thousand dinners and bring them to him myself. Well, make haste then, said the father, both of you. They were as good as their word, and I entered into possession of the house and the estate, and received the ready cash, and have made a large fortune with it over and above what they gave me. And I enjoy it now, and God knows, O oh, Prince of the Faithful, I have never lost an opportunity of showing my gratitude to them, although I can never repay the obligations I owe them. And if you like to kill me for that, you can, so do as you like. Al-Rashid was touched at the man's story, and had the common humanity to let him go. He also from that day removed his prohibition, and allowed the poets to write elegies on the beloved but unfortunate family. End of section 93 this recording is in the public domain. Section 94 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. 
Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Division of the Reward, 8th Century A.D. by E. H. Palmer. Harun al Rashid suffered much from sleeplessness, and to divert himself, would either walk incognito through the streets of Baghdad, accompanied by his trusty companions Jaffa and Mesrur, or he would recline and listen to amusing stories or sentimental poetry. This furnishes really the motive for a great part of the tales of the Arabian Nights, many of the histories there related being told to soothe the caliph in his restless moods. During one of these fits, he said to Jaffa, I am sleepless tonight, and my heart is contracted, and I know not what to do. On this Mesrur, who was standing by, burst out laughing, and Harun sharply asked, Dost thou laugh at me, or art thou mad? No, by Allah, O commander of the faithful, said the attendant, by thy relationship to the chief of the apostles, I could not help it. It was the sudden recollection of a man, named Ibn el Karibi, whom I saw yesterday amusing a crowd on the banks of the Tigris, which made me laugh, for which I humbly beg your majesty's pardon. Bring him here at once, said al Rashid, and Mesrur, having found the wag, brought him to the palace, but, before admitting him, bargained with him that he should give him two-thirds of whatever he might receive from the caliph. To this Ibn el Karibi agreed after much wrangling, and the two were ushered into the imperial presence. After the usual ceremonious greeting, the caliph said, If you do not make me laugh, I will beat you three times with this leathern bag, pointing to one which lay beside him. The fellow, who was not without experience of correction for more formidable-looking instruments, having indeed more than once brought himself into personal communication with the bastinado, thought but little of three blows with a leathern bag, and put forth all his strength to divert the sovereign, uttering drolleries enough to make a melancholy madman laugh, but not a muscle of the caliph's face was seen to move. Now, said the commander of the faithful, you have deserved the beating, and taking up the leathern bag, struck the jester one blow therewith, eliciting a howl, for the bag was filled with large pebbles, and caused no trifling pain. Begging for a moment's respite, he told Harun of the bargain between himself and Mesrur, and begged that the two remaining blows might be given to the attendant as his share, according to agreement. Mesrur was then called in, and on receiving the first installment cried out, O Prince of the Faithful, the third is enough for me, give him the two thirds. This restored the caliph's good temper, and laughing heartily, he rewarded them both. End of section 94 this recording is in the public domain. Section 95 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 95, The Caliph and the Man with the Stew, 8th Century A.D., by E. H. Palmer. Ibrahim el Mosili relates that he went out one day to take the air and get rid of the effects of a too heavy drinking bout, when he perceived a smell of cooking that aroused his appetite. Having ordered his servant to find out from which house the odor proceeded, he presented himself at the door and requested the girl who opened it to allow him to partake of the meal that was being prepared. The girl went to her mistress and at once returned with permission for them to enter. She then tasted the contents of a pot that was upon the fire and set a dish of it before the visitors. Ibrahim found it very savory, ate heartily, and was about to take his departure, when the lady of the house sent word out to say that she regretted the absence of her husband, who would, she was sure, have been pleased to entertain them further and to drink with them. As he was leaving, he passed a man riding upon an ass, who turned out to be the master himself. 
he having learned from the girl what had happened rode after ibrahim and insisted on bringing him back to the house where taking him into the best apartment he set before his guest an elegant dessert and some excellent wine and the two kept up the carousel until the evening the next day ibrahim was told that the caliph had over and over again sent for him during his absence so he hurried to the palace and by way of making his excuses told his adventures and waxed eloquent upon the savoury nature of the stew he had tasted the caliph was amused and said did he not ask you who you were no replied ibrahim we had plenty else to do harun wished to taste the dish for himself and ordered ibrahim to procure an invitation for them both without acquainting their host with their names and rank this was easily arranged for the next night ibrahim telling the hospitable stranger that his friend was deeply in debt and dared not show himself by day for fear of his creditors so the caliph and his companion mounted two asses and rode to the house where they were cordially received and entertained the caliph declared he had never tasted anything like the stew was charmed with all he saw and heard and asked his host about his circumstances my father said he left me a large property and i dissipated the greater part of it but i retrenched in time and thank allah now i want for nothing presently the fumes of the wine and the songs of the singing girls who were present so expanded the caliph's heart that he told ibrahim to take their host aside and tell him who he was so ibrahim said do you know who your guest is no said he why he is the commander of the faithful himself the man on hearing this laughed till he rolled over on his back and kept calling out oh what a wonderfully good thing oh you wag at this the caliph laughed immoderately too and the man called out to his wife what do you think of our guests they have got drunk and repay my hospitality by making fun of me and one of them declares he is the prince of the faithful then offering a glass with mock humility to al rashid he said drink commander of the faithful and harun left the moor but said ibrahim it is really the commander of the faithful pray stop your drunken jokes said the other you have only drunk a couple of glasses and have turned this fellow into the commander of the faithful in another half an hour you will make him out to be the prophet himself when daylight began to appear the party broke up ibrahim failing to convince his host of the truth of his communication told him to ask his neighbors in the morning after el malik the king and after ibrahim el mosili and when asked his name to reply that he was the man with the stew in the morning his neighbors said to him what a noisy party you had last night who were your two guests when he had told them all one of the neighbors said tell me what they were like and on hearing the description declared his conviction that it really was the caliph so the man went off to the house of ibrahim el mosili and sent word in that the man with the stew had called ibrahim at once admitted him rode with him to the palace and presented him to al rashid who insisted on his repeating his sarcastic observations of the previous night which he did to harun's great delight the caliph ordered an immense sum of money to be given to him and bade him tell him the receipt for the celebrated stew no commander of the faithful said he if i were to give away a thing that has proved so valuable to me i should have no advantage left in it i shall be happy to cook it for the commander of the faithful whenever he pleases harun was content with the reply and the lucky host was ever afterwards known as the man with the stew end of section ninety five this recording is in the public domain Section 96 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, read for LibriVox.org by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Poet and the Jester, 8th Century A.D., by E. H. Palmer. 
Zobade, wife of Harun al Rashid, never ceased to urge upon her husband the claims of her son Imin to the entire succession as belonging to the pure Hashimi race on both parents' sides, and she was exceedingly jealous of Harun's other son, Mamun, whom she hated not only as the child of a rival, but as having Persian blood in his veins, and more particularly because of the much more brilliant intellect which he displayed this subject was the cause of many stormy scenes between the royal pair several of which are related by the arab historians on the authority of eye-witnesses on one occasion the story goes the fond mother asserted that imen was an excellent poet and induced him to submit some of his verses to the court jester abu nawas's criticism when the latter pointed out some gross violation of the rules of prosy in one of the lines the young prince flew into a passion and caused abu nawas to be imprisoned some time after harun al rashid sent for the poet was surprised to learn of his incarceration and the reason of it and severely reproved his son imen asked to be allowed to read some other verses in the presence of his father as well as of abu nawas and the caliph acceded to his request as soon as the abu nawas had heard the first few lines he started up to leave the room where are you going asked harun back to prison was the reply end of section ninety six this recording is in the public domain section ninety seven of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org Arabia, Part Three: Stories of Modern Arabia. Historical Note: The world owes much to the Arabians or Saracens for preserving and increasing its knowledge of science and literature through the Dark Ages. They were students and investigators, and the results of their work they gave to others by establishing schools in their principal cities. Some of this culture was imbibed by the Crusaders, and on their return was spread throughout Europe, where it was a potent factor in bringing to an end the ignorance and brutality of the dark ages unfortunately for the caliphate dissensions arose among the moslems numerous lesser chiefs of arabia while willing to acknowledge the ruling caliph as head of their faith refused to accept his sway in temporal matters in the middle of the eighteenth century one wahhabi arose a religious reformer who did not object to holding temporal sway his power increased and early in the nineteenth century even Mecca came under the rule of his successors. Warfare with Egypt led to the downfall of the Wahhabi rule, but about the middle of the century they succeeded in again establishing their control. A wide strip of land along the coast, including Mecca, is in the hands of Turkey. Aden has since 1839 been held by Great Britain. The region of Nejd and the deserts in the southeast are under Arab control. End of section 97 this recording is in the public domain. Section 98 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 98 justice in arabia nineteenth century by colonel l du Corey. after the evening prayer i took my way to the tower calling by the way on said ahmed with whom in our late ramble i had arranged for an early meeting sidi said i addressing him i was going to avail myself this evening of your invitation to visit you whenever convenient to myself but Said Abdel Rahman, having sent word that he expects me after the evening prayer, I called to say that I must defer that pleasure until another time. It so happens, rejoined Said Ahmed, that I too am going to the tower, for tonight the Nagib sits there in judgment. Every second night after the last prayer, the Nagib dispenses justice to the Marabes, and this is an evening for the session of a Mesaur tribunal. I proceeded with him to the tower where we found the Nagib seated upon his cushions at the door of the vestibule. There, surrounded by his chiefs and a crowd of retainers, he rendered important decisions while smoking his chicha. The audience was a large one, for Said Abdel Rahman was very popular with his people, 
owing in great measure to his accessibility to all mussulman sabian or jew provided only he was of the country enjoyed the privilege of access to him at all times to state his case on which the naguib at once rendered justice by a decree based upon equity as well as common sense said ahmed took the place reserved for him among the members of the tribunal while for myself after the interchange of the usual compliments the naguib ordered a chibouk to be brought which he lighted and presented to me with his own hands curious to witness an example of the justice of the country i took up the most convenient position for seeing and hearing as the audience commenced there were women who complained of ill-treatment on the part of their husbands men who accused their wives of frailty divisions of inheritance to adjust thefts and frauds to punish among all which cases there were two particularly remarkable for the judgments rendered upon them the first of these cases was one between a katib and a fallah that is a writer and a peasant the wife of the latter having been taken away from him by the former who maintained that he had a claim upon her the woman declined to acknowledge either the one or the other of them as her husband or rather she acknowledged them both a view of the case which rendered it decidedly embarrassing having heard both sides and reflected a moment the naguib said addressing the claimants leave this woman here and return in half an hour on which the khatib and fallah made their salutations and retired the second case was between a fakay and a zibdai or in other words a fruiterer and a butter merchant the latter very much besmeared with butter the former clean the fruiterer said i had been to buy some butter from this man and drew out my purse full of money to pay for the butter he had put in my gaula when tempted by the sight of the coins he seized me by the wrist i cried thief but he would not let me go and thus have we come before you i squeezing my money in my hand and he grasping my wrist with his and now by mohammed our great prophet i swear that this man lies in saying that i have stolen his money for that money is truly mine the butter merchant said this man came to buy a gula of butter from me and when i filled it he said hast thou change of an abu mathfa a spanish piaster i searched my pocket from which i drew out my hand full of money which i placed upon the sill of my shop from which he snatched it and was going off with my butter and my money when i seized him by the wrist and cried thief but in spite of my cries he refused to return my property to me and i have brought him hither in order that you may judge between us and now by mohammed our great prophet i swear that this man lies in saying i have stolen his money for that money is truly mine the naguib caused the complainants to repeat their charges twice but neither of them varied from his first statement then he said after a moment's reflection leave this money here and return in half an hour on which the fruiterer who had all along kept his hold of the money deposited it in a wooden bowl brought by one of the guards and both complainants having made their salutations retired when they were gone the naguib quitted his seat at the door of the vestibule and went up into the fourth story of the tower taking with him the woman and money in dispute at the appointed moment he returned with them and went calmly back to his seat the parties interested were all present and the khatib and fallah were called up here said the naguib addressing the khatib take thy wife and lead her away for she is thine truly then turning to his guards and pointing to the fallah he said give this man fifty blows of a korbash on the soles of his feet the khatib walked off with his wife and the guards gave the fallah fifty blows of a korbash on the soles of his feet next came the fruiterer and the butter merchant in their turn here said the naguib to the fruiterer here is thy money verily didst thou take it from thine own purse and never did it belong to him by whom thou art accused then turning to his guards and pointing to the butter merchant he said give this man fifty blows of a kerbosh on the soles of his feet the fruiterer walked off with his money and the guards gave the butter merchant fifty blows of a kerbosh on the soles of his feet when the court had risen i asked the naguib how he ascertained that the woman was the wife of the khatib and the money the property of the fruiterer nothing more simple replied he you saw how i went up into the fourth story with the woman and the money but when we arrived there i ordered her suddenly to clean my inkhorn when like one accustomed to that work she at once took it drew out the cotton from it washed it properly replaced it on the stand and filled it with fresh ink 
Then I said to myself, if you were the wife of the Falah, you never could have cleaned an inkhorn like that. You must be the wife of the Khatib. Good, said I, bowing in token of assent. So much for the woman. And how about the money? The money was quite another business, replied the Nagib, smiling with a self-satisfied expression as he leered at me with a look full of artfulness and craft. You must have remarked how buttery the butter merchant was and how greasy his hands were in particular. Well, I put the money into a vessel of hot water, and upon examining the water carefully I could not find that a single particle of grease had come to the surface. Then I said to myself, this money belongs to the fruiterer and not to the butter merchant, for had it belonged to the latter it must have been greasy and the grease would have shown on the surface of the water. At this I bowed very low indeed and said in good faith I doubt whether the great King Solomon himself could have rendered a decision with more sagacity and wisdom. Until then I had always looked upon the tales related to us in the Arabian Nights as mere fictions, but on witnessing the delivery of these two judgments I felt convinced that some of them at least were founded on facts. Of course they are worked up into romances, but they have a basis of reality. End of section 98 Recording by Philip Gould Section 99 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story, Volume 3 Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 99 Wit from Arabia by colonel l du Curé. one one morning nasir eddin effendi ascended into his pulpit to preach and addressing his hearers said o believers know ye what i am going to talk to you about they replied that they did not well then rejoined he since you do not know do you suppose that i am going to tell you another morning he again appeared in the pulpit and said o believers know ye not what i am going to tell you they replied that they did if you know it then said he i need not tell it to you and he descended from the pulpit and went his way his auditors puzzled what to do at length agreed that if he again made his appearance some of them would say that they knew others that they did not and again nasir eddin effendi mounted into the pulpit and said o mussulmans know ye what i am going to say to you to which some replied we know others we know not good returned he let those who know tell those who do not two a fella came in from the country one morning bringing a gazelle to nasir eddin effendi who received it very graciously and invited the donor to dine with him a week afterwards the same man again came to see him but nasir eddin effendi having forgotten him asked him who he was i am he who brought you the gazelle replied the man upon which nasir eddin effendi welcomed him as before some days after this certain strangers having come to claim his hospitality he asked them who they were we are the neighbours of him who brought you the gazelle answered they and he received them as his guests shortly after yet others presented themselves who on being asked by him who they were replied we are the neighbours of the neighbours of the man who brought you the gazelle and nasir eddin effendi bidding them welcome placed before them a cup of cold water only saying drink it is the broth of the broth of the gazelle three one evening nasir eddin effendi borrowed a pot from one of his neighbors and having finished cooking with it he put a stew pan inside it and returned it to the owner the latter seeing the stew pan asked nasir eddin effendi what it was the pot has had a young one replied the latter and went his way another time he again borrowed the pot took it home with him and did not return it five days after the owner of the pot surprised at its not having been returned went to nasir eddin effendi and asked him for it allah be merciful to you exclaimed the latter 
your pot is dead what cried the other do pots die come now retorted nasir eddin effendi you were ready enough to believe that pots can bring forth young ones why then should they not die four one day a beggar knocked at the door of nasir eddin effendi what do you want here asked the latter come down said the beggar man nasir eddin effendi came down and again asked him what he wanted i seek for arms said the beggar man good exclaimed nasir eddin effendi go upstairs the beggar man went up and then nasir eddin effendi said to him the blessing of allah be upon you but why did you not say that while i was below o sidi asked the beggar man why yourself retorted nasir eddin effendi when i was upstairs why did you ask me to come down end of section ninety nine this recording is in the public domain section one hundred of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org by sonia arabian horsemen in battle by adolf schreyer german painter eighteen twenty eight painting page five hundred thirty six the sky is deep blue and cloudy the ground rocky and broken far away at the horizon on the left the smoke from the guns of the enemy may be seen galloping rapidly into the foreground of the picture come a troop of arabs a shell has just exploded and the chief's horse a magnificent dapple grey springs forward in a moment's alarm the white horse of the standard-bearer swerves to the right this is the moment of the picture the famous horses of arabia are distinguished by their broad foreheads expressive eyes and tapering muzzles on a slender fare of barley dates and camel's milk they will make a daily journey of sixty or eighty miles for many days in succession they share the tent of their master and are his comrades and playmates he treats them like petted children and they respond with a rare docility and intelligence an arab will almost as soon sell his child as his beloved horse end of section one hundred this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and one of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 101. A Pilgrimage to Mecca. By Sir Richard F. Burton. In 1853, Captain Richard F. Burton determined to make the pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina. He had an eastern cast of countenance, and could speak arabic and persian with ease he spent some time in familiarizing himself with mohammedan ways prayers ablutions and prostrations and at suez joined a company of pilgrims how well he carried out his assumed character may be known from the fact that his attendant had no idea that he was not a fellow mohammedan the editor having resolved to perform the mecca pilgrimage i spent a few months at cairo and on the twenty second of may embarked in a small steamer at suez with the marmil or litter and its military escort conveying the kiswa or covering for the kaaba on the twenty fifth the man at the wheel informed us that we were about to pass the village of rabik on the arabian coast and that the time had consequently arrived for changing our usual habiliments for the iram or pilgrim costume of two towels and for taking the various interdictory vows involved in its assumption such as not to tie knots in any portion of our dress not to oil the body and not to cut our nails or hair nor to improve the tints of the latter with the coppery hue of henna transgression of these and other ceremonial exactments is expiated either by animal sacrifice or gifts of fruit or cereals to the poor after a complete ablution and assuming the iram we performed two prayer flections and recited the meritorious sentences beginning with the words 
Labaik Allah huma labaik. Here I am, O God, here I am. Here I am, O unassociated one. Here I am, for unto thee belong praise, grace, and empire, O unassociated one. This prayer was repeated so often, people not unfrequently rushing up to their friends and shrieking the sacred sentence into their ears, that at last it became a signal for merriment rather than an indication of piety. On the 26th we reached Jeddah, where the utter sterility of Arabia, with its dunes and rocky hills, becomes apparent. The town, however, viewed from the sea, is not unpicturesque. Many European vessels were at anchor off the coast, and as we entered the port innumerable small fishing boats darting in all directions their sails no longer white but emerald green from the intense lustre of the water crowded around us on all sides and reminded one by their dazzling colours and rapidity of motion of the shoals of porpoises so often seen on a voyage round the cape on disembarking we were accosted by several mutawafs or circuit men so termed in arabic because besides serving as religious guides in general their special duty is to lead the pilgrim in his seven obligatory circuits around the kaaba we encamped outside the town and having visited the tomb of our mother eve mounted our camels for mecca after a journey of twenty hours across the desert we passed the barriers which mark the outermost limit of the sacred city and ascending some giant steps pitched our tents on a plain or rather plateau surrounded by barren rock some of which distant but a few yards mask from view the birthplace of the prophet it was midnight a few drops of rain were falling and lightning played around us day after day we had watched its brightness from the sea and many a faithful haji had pointed out to his companions those fires which were heaven's witness to the sanctity of the spot alhamdulillah thanks be to god we were now at length to gaze upon the Qibla, to which every muscle man has turned in prayer since the days of mohammed and which for long ages before the birth of christianity was reverenced by the patriarchs of the east soon after dawn arose from our midst the shout of labaik labaik and passing between the rocks we found ourselves in the main street of mecca and approached the gateway of salvation one of the thirty-nine portals of the temple of salvation on crossing the threshold we entered a vast unroofed quadrangle a mighty amplification of the palais royal having on each side of its four sides a broad colonnade divided into three aisles by a multitude of slender columns and rising to the height of about thirty feet surmounting each arch of the colonnade is a small dome in all there are a hundred and twenty and at different points rise seven minarets dating from various epochs and of somewhat varying altitudes and architecture the numerous pigeons which have their home within the temple have been believed never to alight upon any portion of its roof thus miraculously testifying to the holiness of the building this marvel however of late years having been suspended many discern another omen of the approach of the long predicted period when unbelievers shall desecrate the hallowed soil in the centre of the square area rises the far-famed kaaba the funereal shade of which contrasts vividly with the sunlit walls and precipices of the town it is a cubical structure of massive stone the upper two-thirds of which are mantled by a black cloth embroidered with silver and the lower portion hung with white linen at a distance of several yards it is surrounded by a balustrade provided with lamps which are lighted in the evening and the space thus enclosed is the circuit ground along which day and night crowds of pilgrims performing the circular ceremony of tawaf realize the idea of perpetual motion we at once advanced to the black stone embedded in an angle of the kaaba kissed it and exclaimed bismillah wa allahu akbar in god's name and god is greatest then we commenced the usual seven rounds three at a walking pace and four at a brisk trot next followed two prayer flections at the tomb of abraham after which we drank of the water of zamzam said to be the same which quenched the thirst of hagar's exhausted son besides the kaaba eight minor structures adorn the quadrangle the well of zamzam the library the clock-room the triangular staircase and four ornamental resting-places for the orthodox sects of hanafi shafi maliki and hanbali we terminated our morning duties by walking and running seven times along the streets of safa and marwa so named from the flight of seven steps at each of its extremities 
after a few days spent in visiting various places of interest such as the slave market and forts and the houses of the prophet and the caliphs ali and abu bakr we started on our six hours journey to the mountain of arifat an hour's sojourn at which even in a state of insensibility confers the rank of haji it is a mountain spur of about a hundred and fifty feet in height presenting an artificial appearance from the wall encircling it and the terrace on its slope from which the imam delivers a sermon before the departure of his congregation for mecca his auditors were indeed numerous their tents being scattered over two or three miles of the country a great number of their inmates were fellow subjects of ours from india footnote sir richard posed as a native of afghanistan End footnote. i surprised some of my mecca friends by informing them that queen victoria numbers nearly twenty millions of mohammedans among her subjects on the fifth of june at sunset commencing our return we slept at the village of mustalifa and there gathered and washed seven pebbles of the size of peas to be flung at three piles of whitewashed masonry known as the shaitans satans of muna we acquitted ourselves satisfactorily of this duty on the festival of the sixth of june the tenth day of the arabian month sulhija each of us then sacrificed a sheep had his hair and nails cut exchanged the ikram for his best apparel and embracing his friends paid them the compliments of the season the two following days the great the middle and the little satan were again pelted and bequeathing to the unfortunate inhabitants of muna the unburied and odorous remains of nearly a hundred thousand animals we returned eighty thousand strong to mecca a week later having helped to insult the tumulus of stones which marks according to popular belief the burial place of abu lahab the unbeliever who we learn from the koran has descended into hell with his wife gatherer of sticks i was not sorry to relinquish a shade temperature of a hundred and twenty degrees and went my way to jeddah en route for england after delegating to my brethren the recital of a prayer in my behalf at the tomb of the prophet at medina in penning these lines i am anxious to encourage other englishmen especially those from india to perform the pilgrimage without being deterred by exaggerated reports concerning the perils of the enterprise it must however be understood that it is absolutely indispensable to be a mussulman at least externally and to have an arabic name neither the koran nor the sultan enjoins the killing of intrusive jews or christians nevertheless two years ago an incognito jew who refused to repeat the creed was crucified by the mecca populace and in the event of a pilgrim again declaring himself to be an unbeliever the authorities would be almost powerless to protect his life end of section 101 end of the world story a history of the world in story song and art volume 3 egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan